Hey everyone, this is Peter D, and welcome back to another episode of Artificial Appetites, the show in which we ask whether or not AI can help us become better cooks in the kitchen. Last week's fusion recipe challenge was tasty, but I felt like it could have been better had I implemented some changes of my own. I'm starting to realize that solely relying on AI to help us achieve our goals is only going to get us so far, but I do believe that it can be used as a tool for learning, and I do intend on exploring that some more in helping us create some original recipes. I'm very excited to get started with this week's episode, and we have a very special guest today. Two-time Oscar winner Mark Mangini will be speaking with us later on in the program. So, to not waste any more time, let's get cooking. This week's episode, Veganize It. The AI created a pulled pork sandwich recipe and challenged me to make it vegan. Now, since it's pork, the first thing that comes to mind is jackfruit, thus making it the pulled jackfruit sandwich. Today's recipe calls for a cup of barbecue sauce. I will be making my own here at home, but if you already have a bottle sitting in the fridge, don't worry, I got you covered. I'll tell you what you'll need to add to make the sauce work. Now, let's take a look at our ingredients list. Here's what we need for the homemade barbecue sauce. One cup tomato sauce, a quarter cup apple cider vinegar, a quarter cup of pure maple syrup, two tablespoons of tamari or soy sauce, quarter cup of unsweetened applesauce or water, one tablespoon of smoked paprika, one teaspoon of garlic powder, one teaspoon of onion powder, half a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of ground black pepper, and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. And for the pulled jackfruit, two cans of green jackfruit in brine or water, one thinly sliced onion, three cloves of garlic, one tablespoon of olive oil or substitute, for me it'll be avocado, one cup of barbecue sauce, half a teaspoon of chili powder, which is optional, and of course, don't forget the buns. For those using their own barbecue sauce, add one tablespoon of soy sauce, one tablespoon of maple syrup, and one teaspoon of smoked paprika. And once you've collected all of those ingredients, we'll move on to prepping. In a mixing bowl, we will be combining our tomato sauce, apple cider vinegar, maple syrup, apple sauce or water, soy sauce or tamari, and all of our spices. You're gonna wanna mix all that together until the consistency almost reminds you of oil paint. Once you're done, you can set it off to the side and turn your burner on to medium heat. Once your pan has warmed, you can then add the barbecue sauce into it. Gonna make sure that we scrape every last bit of this barbecue sauce out of this bowl. And now I'm gonna stir it up real well with my spoon. And then we're gonna let it sit until it begins to simmer. And once that happens, you're gonna wanna reduce the heat to low. We're gonna let this sit here for the next 20 or 30 minutes. And while that does, let's get prepped for our jackfruit. First thing, we're gonna slice up our onions nice and thin. Then we're gonna put this away to the side, grab our garlic, press on them gently to remove the skin. Then we're going to cut them into thirds and smash them down, then finish the mincing process with the blade of our knife. And once your garlic is minced, you can put it off to the side with your onions, Grab your jackfruit, toss it into a colander, and give it a quick rinse. Next, we're going to toss our jackfruit onto our cutting board and remove the hard core pieces. We're also going to remove any seeds that we find. Then with two forks or your hands, you can shred up that jackfruit and give it more of a pulled pork consistency. And since all there's left to do is to wait for the sauce to cook, let's move on to the interview. 
Before I introduce my next guest, I'd like to talk about what sound design actually is. Sound design is the process of creating and manipulating audio elements for various mediums such as films, television shows, video games, live performances, and even this podcast you're listening to right now. It involves creating soundtracks, sound effects, dialogue, and music to enhance the overall experience and to convey emotions or narratives of any particular story. It's an art form that is typically overlooked, with those not realizing the significant impact that sounds can have on our overall perception of storytelling. A good sound editor or designer not only replaces and enhances the sounds from the projects they're working on, but they should also have a keen sense of the psychology of what makes an audience stay engaged and how to keep a storyline moving forward. My guest today is one of Hollywood's longest working professionals in post-production sound and could be easily considered a living legend within the industry. He is a two-time Oscar-winning supervising sound editor and designer who in his early years began working as a sound effects editor for Hanna-Barbera and would carry that experience throughout his illustrious career. Some of the amazing titles that he has worked on include Star Trek The Motion Picture, Escape from New York, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, 48 Hours, Gremlins, The Land Before Time, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, Die Hard, The Fifth Element, The Green Mile, Anchorman, Mad Max Fury Road, Blade Runner 2049, The Accountant, Dune, and most recently, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, just to name a few. And when I say a few, I really mean it because this man has over 150 credits to his name. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Mangini. Hey, Mark. Oh, thank you, Peter. That even I'm blushing. <laughs> Did I cover all the bases there? <laughs> well, I love the very beginning of your introduction where I am now one of Hollywood's longest running something. <laughs> it's like, boy, I feel really old. <laughs> sorry. You know, with respect, of course. <laughs> I under, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to, to be... Um, you know, I think we could just call the interview. I, I think I covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> you have been working in this town for a very long time. What is it now? 47 years? Yeah. How are you even able to maintain such a high level of originality and creativity having worked so long in this industry? I like to think I maintain originality and thank you for starting this interview that way because it's it's that's a really important topic I think for many sound designers and sound professionals. I would say that first of all that is a conscious mission of mine. I recognized early in my career at Hanna-Barbera that the work I was doing felt very factory-like or like assembly line process. We didn't have good budgets and you had to turn around a 30-minute episode in a day and a half or two days. And that didn't allow you the luxury of sort of extemporaneous thinking. You saw a sound moment, you know, um, Fred falls down and you put some bowling pins getting knocked over. You saw... Uh, Fred drive off in his car and you put in the the funny feet noise and it was a, a kind of a rote manufacturing process that didn't yield a lot of time for creativity and that was the beginning of a process where I realized this you know a computer will probably do this work someday humans shouldn't be doing this work and I began to dedicate myself to only wanting to do bespoke work, meaning customized, based on the narrative, based on the on the story kind of sound work. And to achieve that, I found myself creating challenges in every project. And some of them are self-imposed and some of them are obvious. The challenges in, in narrative cinema are usually the, the design-based sounds. You know, you've got to create the sounds of things that don't exist. And it's very clear what the challenges are and how you are going to keep fresh because those are things no one's ever seen before, like sandworms or ornithopters or you name it, any one of thousands of sounds I've designed for those films. And that keeps you pretty fresh, but always in the back of my mind, I'm asking myself, in this process of design, am I repeating either something I've done or worse, what someone else has done? And that, those are the kinds of thoughts that keep me up at night. Um, you know, for better or for worse, we can't always be 100% original because we are influenced by the, our environment. We, we're all moviegoers, we love watching movies, 
And we can't help being consciously or subconsciously being influenced by the, the media we've consumed. And that's why I say I have this kind of backstop, which is this conscience that's always asking me, this might be really good, but have you heard it before? Is it a trope? Is it a cliche? Does it travel any new ground for this genre? Those are some of the ways that I'm trying to keep fresh. And additionally, our work is so complex and often very anxiety-ridden. I find myself compelled to create new because otherwise it's hard work. And the only way to make it fun is to always be challenging yourself to do something new and fresh. I know that Star Wars was a big influence for you growing right. up. You know, the work of Ben Burt. I mean, anyone who does yeah. sound, I mean, Ben Burt should be a household name. One of the greats. Yeah. yeah. He's the John Williams of sound design. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and and so is there someone still working today or maybe who's just new at this that you hear what they've done and said, wow, that I've never thought of doing that. Or, or you find some commonality between the two and you say, well, it's not so much that I'm trying to rip this person off. It's more that it's influential on me. So let me try to make this my own. Interesting. Well, um, I am deeply envious of my peer group. <laughs> there are so many accomplished sound designers in our field, and I loathe that feeling of going to another film. It's almost an anxiety for any film I see, for the fear that I will have that moment, and I always do, where I say, that was really good. How did they do that? How did they come up with that idea? Would I have come up with that idea? Where do I have to undergird my education so that I would have ideas like that? And that's been an ongoing dialogue in my head for 47 years so that I could always feel confident in my work knowing I've done the research and I know that if I did come up with an original idea, it's probably an original idea. I love seeing movies and I love hearing new approaches. You know, when I lecture and give seminars, I almost never give specific advice on how I did something. Um, because I don't think that's valuable advice for anyone. That, because that means someone's going to imitate a technique and that doesn't advance the inner artist in them because artistry ultimately comes from some unknown mystical place where we don't know what causes us to have a creative thought that manifests itself in the form of a sound no one's ever heard before. And I want to encourage the processes that helps others develop that skill and not imitate a plug-in cocktail I used or a combination of sounds that was successful for a very specific sound in a very specific context in a very specific film. And I said that because early in my career, as you know, because you've read, uh, ben Burt was an icon to me. Everything that he did, and even to this day, to me always feels fresh and original and bespoke. And I wanted to be the next Ben Burt. And I studied everything that he wrote and spoke about. And I found myself becoming better and better at being a, a lukewarm Ben Burt. Because <laughs> I, I would never be him. Right. And that's when the light bulb kind of went off. And I realized I have to start being me. And I want to be hired for being me, not for being someone else. And I can say that because... I remember early in my career going on interviews with producers and they would say something like, oh, we hear you're the new Ben Burt. And at first that felt good. It felt like acknowledgement. And then I began to realize, I don't want to be Ben. I love Ben. Let's have Ben be Ben. And let's have people hire me because they know Mark brings his fresh and original ideas. Yeah, I think that's what keeps you going for so many years is that you separate yourself from not being the next Ben Burt, but by being the new Mark Mangini. Yeah, well, the new, let's call this podcast the new Mark Mangini, fresh lemon scent added. And we can talk about a side project if you like, Mark. <laughs> there are times when I'm watching something on TV or in a theater and my focus shifts from the storyline over to the sound work and... I was wondering if that ever happens to you as someone who works in the industry. Um, do you have a hard time separating the work from the storyline? Um, interesting. Uh, I, I don't think you and I 
are able to turn off that critical listening mechanism. It, it makes it hard for me to watch any kind of entertainment with sound, which is a lot of entertainment. And what I, the connection I do make is, there's two ways to look at this. If I find myself walking out of a theater having not thought about the sound but loving the movie, I knew everything about the sound in the movie narratively worked. And I know that when I catch myself monitoring my critical ear while I'm watching something, I know probably something isn't working. Either the sound was too, I don't know, broad, or it, the sound drew too much attention to itself, which caused me to think about it, which took me out of the movie. So that might be a sign that that wasn't a successful beat. That doesn't mean it isn't a successful movie or even a successful soundtrack. But if I find myself cognizant of sound and in a way removing myself from the participation as an audience member, I realize maybe this could have been done another way. So um, when I work on films, when a director first brings a project to me, my first job is to do everything I can to turn off my critical listening faculty and try to enjoy that story as much as I can and then in some way internalize it so that I understand all its narrative and dramatic beats because I have this belief for me that I cannot begin the sound design process until I understand the story. Once I understand the story, and this means literally from the perspective of like the actor and the writer, like. What are these characters saying? What's the point of this scene? Why are we here? And what does that mean about the ending an hour and a half from now? When I understand all of that, the sound design process, I believe, becomes that much more simple. It's that much more direct. When you know where the story is going, you know where the sound is going. I think when you don't have that deeper understanding, you're a mechanic. You're, you're really just making sounds and they, they may have less of a connection to the narrative itself. With how fast most projects move, as an example, post-production sound typically is like four to six weeks for a final delivery, whereas picture editorial can take minimum three months. Yeah, I think you've earned this right in which you have so much more time to work on these projects and to get on board with the directors well before the project has even started. If I'm not mistaken, I believe with Dune, you were on the project 12 months before shooting. Is that correct? No, no. Uh, 12 months before the final mix, but we started in pre-production by reading the script and giving notes to Denis Villeneuve. And then um, we came on relatively full-time during the shoot, starting with the commencement of Principal Photography. And we were integral, we meaning Theo Green and I, we were co-supervisors and co-sound designers on Dune. And we were building, designing, along with the edit, as, as Joe Walker was developing the edit, and as Hans Zimmer was experimenting with uh, musical textures, we were all working together. Um, and I would argue that it is self-evident the value of that process if you look at the success of movies like Dune and Blade Runner and Mad Max Fury Road, all of which embraced this idea of sound being an early participant that could be proactive versus reactive. Because reactive is the, the scenario you just outlined. The movie's been shot, edited, and maybe even the score is done by the time you receive it and now you have never enough time in post-production. And we're called post for a reason, it's after shooting. And that robs us of some ability to be um, interactive. On movies like Dune and Blade Runner, Theo and I had the opportunity to design sound before visual effects were started or at the same time, and we had a symbiotic relationship. Sometimes we would design a sound, feed it to visual effects, they'd get an idea, and that would, that would inform the first iteration of the shot. They'd send it back to us, 
we'd react to what they did visually and be inspired and improve the sound. And then you now you can see this iterative cycle that we're developing that results in, I believe, in a, a, a kind of verisimilitude that you couldn't achieve any other way because everything we did is so inextricably tied, it just feels natural. So you can see, I, I think what I'm saying is you can see the value of this kind of approach, but of course, I recognize not all budgets support that, not all filmmakers support that, or even feel comfortable with a process like that. And so, you know, I have to acknowledge, right at the beginning of this um, discussion, I recognize I live in an ivory tower. I, I uh, have the privilege of working on movies that have the budgets and the time and the willingness to support the, the this incredible belief in the, the power of sound to um, support the story. It's like um, if you're a, a wood finisher, you know, you put on a lacquer and then you polish the lacquer with a 50 grit and then it looks nice, but it's not shiny yet. And then you hit it with a 100 grit and then you hit it with a 200, then you hit it with a 600 and before you know it, you have a mirror finish, which is what you wanted the end result to be. I am attacking sound in the same way. I'm making sure the finish gets put on so that the furniture is protected and everything is there that you must have, but it can be better in stages if you have the time and money. Yeah, what is the saying? You don't ever finish a project, you just surrender? Yeah. <laughs> what I really appreciate about the work is that it seems so fresh and new with every project that you do work on. But... I also noticed that you're not afraid to go back to your Hanna-Barbera days. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there was a scene in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles where Raph's sigh hits Donnie right in the leg, <laughs> and you hear the spring mixed in with a real hit, yeah. which, by the way, for anyone who has not seen the movie yet, it is so well done on every front. But what I want to know is how much of your own personal library in which you record and design, and I'd like to add for anyone who's interested in these sounds, they can be found at prosoundeffects.com. Um, how much of these sounds are you relying on versus going out and recording everything new and fresh for each new project that you work on? There's two answers to that. The first is the instinctual impulse to always be original. That will never go away for me. And that to be original does not mandate all fresh sound. It encourages it, but I am I am practical and a realist, and even on a, a, a properly budgeted film like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I don't have enough money or budget, nor did I on Dune, uh, to record everything fresh. In my ideal world, when I'm, I'm, when I'm king of everything, a director will come to me someday and say, Mark, I want you to record everything fresh for this movie. And that's when I retire or something. I don't know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not holding my breath for that to happen. But that's an ideal we all aspire to and none of us ever get to. But the goal is to record as much original material as possible, given the time and budget that you have. And because I am an inveterate sound recordist, it means that even when I use my sound library, these are fresh, the freshest and or fresher sounds than maybe another individual might have who isn't always recording. My library is a function of me always recording and I go to recordings that no one else has, which makes them original in a certain sense. I'm not using the commercial libraries, though on occasion, there's just the right sound in a commercial library that I have never recorded or I didn't have a fresh approach to when I tried to record it. So I'm not, there's, I'm not throwing shade on commercial libraries. They all have a value, nor am I throwing shade on the importance of having a library. I could not finish a film without a proper sound library, but I know I'm, I have an advantage because I've been recording so long uh, that I can turn to my library for the things I cannot record and still have something really unique that no one has heard before. Are there any genres that you have not worked in that you would like to if approached? I don't see any Westerns. Am I wrong to say that you have not worked on a Western before? I worked briefly on my dear friend Gavin O'Connor's um, Jane Got a Gun. That was really fun. 
But I don't have it on my resume because my dear friend uh, Piero Mura, a really accomplished sound designer and supervisor, completed the film, and I didn't want to steal his thunder, and he did a great job. But I did some of the original design work and some early recordings for it. What would you say is the strangest sound effect request that you've received? The strangest was from Mel Brooks. I did a pretty obscure science fiction film called Solar Babies. And Solar Babies was Mel's kind of first attempt at creating science fiction to leverage the Star Wars popularity. He would eventually make space balls as a satire. And in Solar Babies, they, they had a white, glowing ball that was meant to have pseudo-religious spiritual properties to it. And it was just literally a lucite ball with like Christmas lights on the inside of it. And it would just glow occasionally when they wanted to, you know, it was kind of like an oracle. The kids would go to the ball and ask a question or look for inspiration and it would just glow. And Mel decided that he wanted the orb to speak without words, but he wanted it to sound religious like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite the ask. How did you get that to work? Well, I, I got to tell you, it's one of the few times where I, I, I didn't accomplish the task. I would design that sound 18 times for Mel. You know, I'd go off fool around, come back, okay, Mel, listen to these sounds. No, it's not quite, it's not quite um, stentorian enough. Okay, I'll go back. Uh, no, that, I hear too much language. Make it more ethereal. And we, and, and it got to the point where Mel would say, use, he was running out of words to describe sound because he didn't have a facility for sound in a certain way. So he would use metaphors like, Mark, it's not green enough, or it's not blue enough, or it's it's too jazz, it's not enough rock and roll. Um, and I would leave the project after nine months and turn that over to the great John Pospisil to solve the problem. Blue, things are blue, they're red, and they're not enough, a little jazzy, not enough rock and roll. I I still hear those terms <laughs> of today. Well, but isn't it vital, though, for all of us as sound designers to learn to interpret those terms? We're going to come across them, and we need to make sense of them. Oh, yeah, no doubt, because without that communication with the uh, filmmakers, there's just so much that can go wrong. Uh, you, one example is that you do all this extra sound work that you think is appropriate for the film, and then they come in and say, well, I don't want any sound here. I just want to put music over it. Has that ever happened to you? You know, I did this movie called The Fifth Element, and it was for Luc Besson, and it was a really great experience. Luc set me free to do what I wanted to do with almost no management. As he did, I would discover, with all the other department heads. He hired great people in every discipline and let them do what they do. This would cause a, a, a small hiccup in the final mix of The Fifth Element because there was one particular scene that we had never talked about. There was a big, an epic space battle early in the film where the Mangalores are attacking the Mondashuans and it's a spaceship battle and very Star Wars-like with ships flying over and shooting at each other and things crashing into planets. And of course, I built that as an epic science fiction space battle. And Luke came in, he didn't even sit pre-dubs with us, and he only did one sound design review session with me in, in the six months of development. And he came into the final mix, and the lights came up, you know, we played the reel, and what do you think? And he said, and he turned to me and he said, Mark, I'm really, really sorry about this. We never had a chance to have this conversation, but I wrote this script with Eric Serra, the composer of Fifth Element, when we were kids. We'd been dreaming of telling this story for decades. And we had always imagined this as being an operatic moment driven by music and almost exclusively by music. And he took out, and he apologized, he said, I, this hurts to do this, it's my fault for not communicating this, but this is the direction we need to go in. And that's, that's what we did. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. All right, at this time, we're going to take a quick pause from the interview to remove our sauce, which should be ready at this point. 
you can go ahead and pour that into a container or back into your mixing bowl and leave it off to the side for now as it won't be used until later on. So now our next step is to take a clean skillet and place it on a stove and let it warm over medium heat. And once the pan is sufficiently warmed, you'll want to pour in your olive oil or your substitute and make sure that you spread the oil around evenly so that we coat every part of the pan. And once you've done that, you can then toss in your onions and your garlic into the pan. And then we're going to make sure that we mix everything with our spoon and flatten out the ingredients as much as possible so that everything sautés evenly over the next four to five minutes. So once the onions and the garlic have sautéed and slightly caramelized, you're going to want to add the jackfruit into the skillet. You're going to stir it occasionally over the next four to five minutes. Once those five minutes are up, you'll add the barbecue sauce, lower the heat to low, and let it simmer over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Don't forget to stir it occasionally throughout this process. So now that we have our instructions, let's get back to Mark Mangini. With how quickly technology is advancing and with the advent of AI, do you see it as a threat to our industry or do you think that there is room for it to be used as not a replacement, but as a tool? I'm, uh, I'm not, and I use this term very carefully because it's unfair, but I'm not a Luddite in that sense. And I learned a valuable lesson very early in my career at Hanna-Barbera when we were still editing on sprocketed sound on these giant sewing machines called moviolas. And a year into my tenure there, someone told me about a company in Hollywood called Nyman Tiller and Associates that had the world's first digital editing system that they had designed in conjunction with IBM. And it terrified me. I, I knew this was in mid 70s. The personal computer age was just dawning and it just seemed clear that I'm gonna be an out of a job if I don't embrace this somehow. And I was a very early adopter of computer-based uh, sound libraries and editing systems. And I went and saw that system and I, I couldn't believe it. Something that took me 10 minutes to do, go to the library, find a roll of sprocketed sound, thread it up on this machine, synchronize it with the image, edit it with splicers, splicing tape it together, that's a five minute process, took 10 seconds on a computer. It didn't rob me of any of my creative abilities. The computer didn't decide what was the best sound for the job, but it eliminated the mundane work. So I do believe that AI is going to have a place in what we do in the sense that it will streamline our work and make the rote chores um, um, more efficient and um, perhaps hopefully yielding to us more time to do creative work. The, the creative side of it's kind of interesting. I think there is a universe where in retail audio, I use the term retail as a generic term for nobody seems to care as long as the work is done. In retail audio, there's gonna be broadcast streaming projects where the director just just make sure all the sounds are there. Put the Foley in sync. I just need Foley, I don't need great Foley. I just need gunshots, I don't need great gunshots. I just need a monster sound, I don't need a bespoke one. That's a big part of our universe where people like you and I are simply automatons. We're just putting in the sounds, using some gut instincts about it, but we don't get a lot of time to, to play around. I think AI will find um, inroads in that part of our our work. But I'm, I'm equivocal about the creative side. Um, I'm cynical because currently uh, uh, AI is an iterative process, which is to say it has to leverage pre-existing work. It has to have a large language model or it has to have a corpus to build from. The bigger the corpus, the more varied the output result might be. But in any respect, what you see as the output is still the sum total of someone else's ideas, not your own. And we can argue whether that output is original or not. I would also argue that there is a fomenting movement in creative communities 
that is taking notice of this because writers and painters are recognizing their work in AI output and realizing that the, the algorithm leveraged some small portion of what they did as original, and that's plagiarism. That's against the law to do that. And at some point, I think the creative community will or should come together and say, the output of AI is the sum total of our collective works. It is not original. And you Google, you Apple, you whomever had no right to use our work to generate your output. That's my hope. I think there's also an argument, and I wholeheartedly agree with what you just said, um, but I know there's also an, an argument to be made that it's those same people who may notice that their art is being used, what inspired them to make that art? And so are we not all in some way or another just taking from others and making it our own? And so like that, that's the fine line, right? Like where's the gray area with AI? It's That's what we're still trying to figure out. And I know that there was a court that just struck down uh, the notion that it could be copyrighted, and they said no. So AI work is not copyrightable. Interesting. Um, y you asked really the $64,000 question because it's like asking, you know, I don't know where my creative impulses come from, but I do know that somehow they are a reflection of the sum total of my experiences, just as that AI output is the sum total of its experiences, its corpus, its body. And yet I'm not willing to acknowledge that when I have a creative idea, there's some connection to what AI is doing because I think it comes from a deeper, more complex place. And the, the unique distinction is simply this. When I have a creative idea, I know it's original. When AI has an output, we know it's it's the leveraging of someone else's original ideas. That that is a, that distinction we can definitely call today. Now, you know, when you say where do our creative impulses come from? Well, that's like asking what is love. I, I don't know if there's any deep answer to that other than currently, maybe be, as a symbol of my age and generation, I want to believe that's a mystical thing, and I want to continue to encourage artists to create the environment where the, that the creative impulse can come and flow through them without fear, um, without fear that there's this, this no, no longer a place for the human spirit. So this podcast was indeed a creative impulse. I wanted to know if AI could help me be a better cook. I am lucky that I have someone at home who is a fantastic cook, but I should be able to hold my own as well. And so I thought it'd be a fun experiment to do. Is that something that you like to do? Do you like to cook as well? And how are you maintaining a healthy lifestyle with the amount of hours that you put in on any particular project? I eat pretty healthy. My wife happens to be a tremendous cook as well, and I rely on her for most of our meals, but I spent a good portion of my 20s as a single man, and, I, and my mom and dad are Italian and great cooks, and I learned to cook from my mom and I've learned to cook from my wife, and I'm a good cook, but I don't spend enough time doing it, but I find it a very zen exercise. I love being in the kitchen, and it, in a way, it's kind of like what we do in our sound design suite, where we're, we're doing some kind of creating, and we're, we're applying ourselves to a challenge of how can I make this as delicious as it can be, and Here's the result I want at the end. How do I get there with these ingredients? Isn't that exactly what we do in our sound design suites? We try to put together a, a great dish with the freshest ingredients um, to please ourselves at the end so that we can consume it. And I would argue that in a way that that metaphor can be extended so many different ways um, we are creating a dish for ourselves when we're designing, and we wouldn't serve it to the director unless we would serve it to ourselves, right? You, would, you wouldn't play a bad sound or a non-tasty dish to the director. And if you were to cook an actual meal for the director, what would it be? Oh, it would be pasta. I can make a number of good pasta sauces, um, pretty good with salads, pretty good with stir-fry, um... I'm not a baker. I'm not a dessert maker. It would, it would be Italian. I could make just about any anything with meat and pasta I can make and, and do a good job with. 
cutlets, Parmesan, uh, piccata, those kinds of things. I'm confident that I know the answer to this, but have you ever recorded food for a sound effect? Oh, of course. As you know, it's a go-to for body sounds when you need crunching, squishing, ripping, fleshy sounds. You know, the, the celery and the carrots and the, the watermelons are, are constant targets. Um, it, this is slightly askew of the actual question, but on Dune, I needed to make the sounds of the ornithopter ailerons and landing gear. And one day while making espresso, I noticed that the motor that grinds the beans had this great whirring sound. So I took all the beans out of it so I could record just the grinder. And that made beautiful servo motors that I hadn't heard. I, I have thousands of servo motors, but I hadn't heard them quite that way. So I used my espresso machine for motorized sounds for the ornithopters. I've got a Keurig here at home that when it brews, it sounds like there's a cat drowning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, my partner Richard used the steamer one when you're steaming the milk in the, in the cup. It makes these great, like almost like jet propulsion or rocket engine because they're very noise based. They're not very tonal or melodic. And he used those for rocket ship sounds for a film. So that's pretty valuable. Do you have any hidden Easter eggs that you like to drop in each one of your uh, projects? A sound that you try to squeak in there, just, you know, you're like, I'm just going to hide it under here. No one will ever notice that it's in there. <laughs> I just developed a new one, and I'm not sure I'm ready to talk about it. But the my favorite in the past has been building into, if there is a, a scene in a bar or anywhere where there's a crowd of more than three or four voices where I would put a wall of track, um, I will put in the voice of one of my dear f sound friends who is deceased. And this way, they, for me, they live on in perpetuity because to me, cinema is art. And I think all these movies that I've been lucky enough to work on will live, a, have a long, long life, even long after cinemas are gone. And this allows, in my mind, allows them to live in my art forever. And you would never know it. I mean, I could point them out but only a really good sound person. If I said, oh, this is my buddy Warren saying, hey, get out of here, you'd hear it, but you'd, there'd be no way you'd ever find it unless I pointed it out. And if someone were to make a movie out of you, what kind of sound design would that have? <laughs> Gee. Um, well, I think circling back to almost the very beginning, I would want the sound design for my life to feel... Look, I, I, I think we're all unique and original, and I, I, um, I exhort my audiences and my listeners and my readers to be themselves and to be as original as possible so that they're always expressing themselves. And therefore, I'd want the soundtrack to my life to feel that way, that the viewer was not experiencing something they hadn't experienced before. I'm trying to tie it together with my overall philosophy. Just keep it fresh and, and, and bouncy along the way. Well, look, you know, interesting you use the adjective bouncy because life isn't always bouncy and life is full of disappointment and fear and anger and sadness. And if we have the time, I'll tell you a brief story. One of the joys of working with the George Millers of the world and the Denis Villeneuve's of the world is that they recognize the importance of failure. And they recognize the importance of working through failure as a means to get to success. Um, that it was such a refreshing revelation to me in my first design review sessions with these great directors because you would present something and there's the natural anxiety any one of us would have, you know, showing our art to someone and having them weigh in on it. And you're always afraid, what if they don't like it? Well, these great filmmakers have a way of embracing the mistake, if you will, or the failure as in a completely different light that isn't failure, it is a stepping stone towards success. And so therefore, it's valuable 
I think for we as sound creatives and for filmmakers of all stripes to recognize the value of how the failure gets you to success and the acceptance of that iterative process of constant refinement until you find what actually works. I mean, can you imagine if a film editor was judged by their rough cut? Think of how many times a film editor goes through the movie, hundreds, thousands, making hundreds and thousands of little tweaks, a frame off of this, stick in a shot there, why should any film editor deliver a fully a cut that is absolutely great the day after production complete, you know, principal photography completes? We should not be expected to do the same, but I find that often we are expected to function on that plane of constant success. So I think um, a bouncy is only one of the modalities we need to learn to live in. Boun you don't get to enjoy bouncy if you never had despair. Sure. The ball's got to be flat a few times for you to yeah. enjoy it. There's yeah. the title for this podcast, Bouncy versus Despair. <laughs> <laughs> if you were not in this industry, what do you think would have been your next passion? Well, music, uh, guitar playing, and I've, I've managed to keep my musical career kind of percolating. I've had songs in about 15 or 20 movies, and I keep playing the guitar. I just had a song in the latest season of the Star Trek Picard series. So it would have been and will be music. I continue to play and write, and more than likely when I tire of going into the studio every day, I will adopt music as a full-time passion. And maybe stand-up comedy will, will, will somewhere fit in in there. Is that something that you've tried before? I have. I took two seasons of improv comedy classes, and it was an amazing experience. One I would recommend to any creative. It teaches you invaluable um, skills uh, as a speaker and as a listener. And in fact, the, one of the most salient skills of any great improv comedian is, is the ability to listen. The first rule that they teach you in improv comedy is this um, bon mot called yes, comma, and, meaning that acknowledges what you heard the, your comedy partner saying and you want to add to it so that it furthers the conversation, it furthers the comedy, not interrupts it. And that's such a valuable skill to develop when you're working with directors and you're put on the spot and you're in the moment. You always want to be additive, not subtractive. Hey, would you like to play a little game with me? All right. I recorded some sounds before our call today, and I'd like for you to guess what I used to make those sounds and what you would use them for. Oh, dear. Now I'm on the spot. All right. Here we go. <laughs> what, it's, what it sounds like is you're rubbing your thumb across the top of a balloon, and you're getting that striation. And the first thing I thought of was the glottal sounds that a big dinosaur makes. Like when they're, they're not roaring, they're going like getting ready to attack. That's pretty close. It's actually my kid's water cup filled with water and my hands are wet. Mm. And as I'm turning my hands on the cup, it's making that squeaking sound. Ah, <laughs> great sound. All right, here comes the next one. <laughs> It, it sounds like the Flintstones um, car skid sound without the break in it. It's a hot water bottle. <laughs> doing doing what? Filling it up with air and then turning it on concrete. Oh, well, it's all right. So there's a rubbing rubber on, on pavement uh, aspect to it. I'm not too far off. <laughs> it, it sounds like an old rusty um, playground swing set. It, it, I, I had a swing set, you know, as you're swinging back and forth and you did, it's all, it sat in your backyard for 10 years. It's just this little picture frame. Oh, well, not too you're far. Swinging back and forth. <laughs> you are a hoarder, aren't you? You have all these Foley <laughs> objects. Yeah. All right. Here's the next one. Not a clue. Not a clue. It's a bit diffuse. So I can't not only put my finger on what it is, but what I'd use it for. It sounds like something sliding with some some friction, but I, I can't, it, you know, I'm thinking like a, 
a slow it down and a plane lands on the tarmac and its landing gear have gone out and it just skids on its belly. It's a can of compressed olive oil sprayed on a pan. And the pan is hot? No, it's cold. Inter- I would never have guessed that. Don't start a game called Stump the Sound Designer. <laughs> Don't invite <laughs> me as your first contestant. <laughs> All right, I'll give you one more. Here we go. <laughs> Well, um, funny you should play that because I have a sound just like that that I created. I had to repair my dishwasher and there was a piece of plastic corrugated hose. That's the one. And I <laughs> and I got all sorts of sounds just like that from my dishwasher corrugated Yeah, it's such a great little hose. item to keep around. You blow into it or you swing it around. Yeah, you swing it around. And <laughs> do, you, do, I get to, do I win a t-shirt for guessing that last one? Well, as soon as I have some merch available, I'll be sure to send you something. <laughs> okay. And if you wouldn't mind, I have one last item I'd like to show you. All right. You know, it sounds like insect scurrying. That's what I'd use it for, but I don't know what it is, because that, that sounds not hard to duplicate. It's this piece of plastic with a spring on it. I don't even know where it came from. Oh, it, now it sounds more metallic. In the recording, I didn't hear any of the metal in it. Yeah, because at first all I was doing was swinging it around. Oh, yeah. And to be honest, I used a video micro Rode microphone that I have for my iPhone. Uh, I was a little pressed for time, and I'm sure it could have been a better recording had I used my folding mics. Yeah. All right, Mark, I'm nearing the end of my cooking time here, but before I let you go, are there any new projects that you would like people to know about? I, you know, it's... I've been pitching a show to CBS for a while that is the sound equivalent of a cooking show. I want to kind of in the mold of, of um, Anthony Bourdain where you go out into the world and you gather ingredients. It would maybe show me recording all sorts of disparate things and you don't know what they're going to be for. And then you come back into the kitchen and you cook up a sound that you would never have imagined would have come from all these other sounds. 32 Sounds is a documentary I did uh, that came out as a streaming project early in the year this year, and it's now touring the country as a live show that I did the sound for and as a cinema um, experience. And it's a beautiful documentary. Even though it's called 32 Sounds, it's not, although we present 32 Sounds, we use them as an excuse to explore how we listen and what sounds mean to us as human beings and how important sound is to all of us. So you get a little bit of fun um, exploring these individual sounds, but you get a lot of fun um, and I think information on how humans, not sound people, this is, this is a general audience film, how, how, we, how we listen, how does that, how does that all work? And, what do we make of the things we listen to? And, and how does that cause us to change our attitude towards the world? So 32 Sounds uh, is certainly worth seeing if it's in a, in a cinema or in a live theater venue near you because part of the fun of it is if you see the live version, our director, Sam Green, does live narration and our composer, J.D. Sampson, does live musical accompaniment and then you stop and you watch these pre-recorded film clips on a screen in the theater and everything is done with headphones. We travel with 500 FM based headphones and it's a full binaural mix and it's really pleasing. There's opportunities to dance in it and get up out of your seat and sing. But it's worth going to 32sounds.com and seeing where the next show is, live or cinematic. Um, what else? There's, um, I feel like I'm forgetting one other. Well, of course, there's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is still in theaters. <laughs> Go see that. It came out pretty good. It seems like you can sit here and talk about this for days on end. Oh, I can go for days. Just just push me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. It's been such a great pleasure, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye. All right. So at this time, we can go ahead and turn the heat off and get ready to plate our pulled jackfruit sandwich. 
So jackfruit is often referred to as a quote-unquote vegetable meat because of its meat-like texture when it's ripe. It could also be used in both sweet and savory dishes, which is what I expect out of this pulled jackfruit sandwich. And of course, adding the chili powder and the cayenne pepper is really gonna kick it up a notch and help to counterbalance some of that sweetness. In keeping with the vegan theme, for my sides, I chose the Trader Joe's mango jicama slaw with a lime mango vinaigrette and their jerk flavored plantain chips. All right, time for the taste test. And as always, we're out in the backyard and we're about to taste our meal. Here we go. Mmm. Mm hmm. Man, that's so good. It's got the consistency of pork. It doesn't necessarily taste like pork, but it's still delicious nonetheless. I can definitely eat this anytime. Um, you might notice that I have put the slaw on top of the jackfruit inside the burger. Mm. Mm -hmm. It was definitely giving it a whole different flavor. Mm. I'd like to once again thank my guest Mark Mangini for taking the time and talking uh, with us today. I'm gonna enjoy the rest of this jackfruit pulled pork sandwich. And if you like the show, don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on all the socials. Mm -mm. And until next week, happy eats. Mm -mm. Artificial Appetites is written and produced by me, Peter D. Original theme music by the one and only Song Aria. Additional music for this week, Aves, Magic Solo, and Few Doors. If you like the show, please like and subscribe on YouTube. You can also follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Facebook, and Instagram.